Hello and welcome to this Bone Matters session. Today's session is all about the causes of osteoporosis, why you might have weaker bones that are more likely to break. So we're going to be talking about all the factors that could put you in that higher risk bracket. We're also going to talk a bit about why it's useful to find out more about your risk and also what you can do about it. I'm delighted to welcome today Professor Neil Gittos, um, who is a doctor, a consultant who specialises in osteoporosis. He's in fact an endocrinologist working in Birmingham. So welcome, uh, Professor Gittos. Um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and your role and perhaps what an endocrinologist is. Indeed, thanks, Sarah. So yes, as you say, I'm a, an endocrinologist or a hormone specialist, I suppose people will recognise that most associated with. My particular area of interest within endocrinology is, I suppose, technically metabolic bone disease. So that's diseases, medical type of diseases affecting bone, calcium, phosphate and bone density. And of course, what we're talking about today, osteoporosis and that thing that we're always trying to prevent, fractures associated with osteoporosis. Thank you. And perhaps just quickly tell us a little bit about your role at the charity, because that's quite a big one, too. Yes, yeah, so I, I have a long history with the Royal Osteoporosis Society over many years. Um, I chaired the clinical and clinical and scientific committee in years gone by and have worked as a trustee. And then over the last coming up two years now, have been chair of the board of trustees of the ROS. Thank you. And thank you for your time today, because it's uh, it's great that you're giving it to us. So thanks. Right. Um, you are audience. Let's let's think about why you might be listening. Um, you may have osteoporosis and want to find out more about why um, you may have checked out your risk already using our online risk checker. More about that later. And you probably just want to understand a bit more about what's been going on for you. And hopefully this, the discussion we're having today is going to answer some of your questions. So I'm going to start right at the beginning um, and, and ask you, Professor Gittos, what, what is a risk factor? What, what do we mean by that? Yeah, thanks. So, so risk factors, um, I suppose we're, we're brimming with risk factors for all sorts of things. And the fact that we're alive um, and we're made up of different components of things, some of the way that we are, we, we're in control of, that we can modify them, and other things we are inherently part of us uh, as people. So they are modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors, and risk factors make us more susceptible to something, an event or an outcome, um, I th or prone, I suppose, is another way, being prone to a condition. And the kind of things that we'll be talking about today is, if we think across the portfolio of what makes us individuals, which of those risk factors uh, are we in control of? And some of those will relate to lifestyle factors like what we eat and drink and how much we exercise. But other risk factors that make us prone to osteoporosis and fractures may well be things like our genetic makeup, um, con health conditions that we have, um, drugs that we have to take for various types of uh, underlying medical problems. So it's a conglomeration of things, some that we're in control of, and some that we have to live with and try to modify via other means. Thank you. I think that's a, a great in introduction. And we we often get questions about this. Many of the listeners will know about this thing called bone density, which is obviously a, a measurement of our, our bone strength. And perhaps you could talk a little bit more about these risk factors. Do they do they affect our bone density? Can we can we check out by having a scan what's going on? Because I know that's quite complicated. So Tell us a little bit more. Yeah, it's a really great question. There's lots embedded in this. So I suppose the first thing to say is that bone density scans or DEXA scans are really good tests to give us some idea of bone strength. So they're good. They're really helpful. However, they're not, they don't act in isolation. And we have to think of other factors that sit around bone density. And an obvious one, of course, is, is our age. So the way when I look at a bone density scan, the way I interpret it in my mind in relation to fracture risk is largely determined by the age of the person. So a result from a bone density scan in somebody 
who's age 45 or 50 is quite different in terms of the risk of fracture that it conveys to somebody who's 75 or 80 because age is such a strong predictor of fracture risk. So the number at the bottom of the DEXA scan is not the be-all and end-all and it needs to be contextualised clinically to the person sitting in front of you and that there is a conversation around that and I'm glad you've raised that Sarah because it can be misleading. People go along with a number and say I think I need or that I don't need but there needs to be a rounded discussion to put that in the context of these other risk factors that I'm sure over the next 30 minutes or so that we'll talk about. And perhaps is it worth saying a little too am I right that we, we know that bone density doesn't always tell us, it, well, it doesn't tell us about the quality of our bones. So there's other things going on inside that it, it perhaps can't show, which is why these other risk factors contribute more to that picture of our bone strength. Is, is that useful, do you think? No, you're absolutely right. So some of the risk factors that we're aware of mediate their effects through bone density, but others will have uh, somewhat independent actions on bone that can increase risk of fracture and I suppose a, a, a one that perhaps just to mention at this point because it fits that bracket so well is the use of steroid medication drugs like prednisolone often taken by mouth so those drugs can reduce bone density but we know for sure that above and beyond the effect that they have on bone density the effect of those steroid drugs increase the risk of fracture in addition to the reduction in bone density. So it's not a simple straight line correlation. Like most things in life, there's complexity here. It is complicated and thank mm -hmm. you. That's been really useful. And we're not going to talk a lot about falls, about falling over today, but I guess perhaps just a quick mention of that as, as a risk factor. Yeah, it's, it's important, isn't it? And, and I think we have to check ourselves sometimes as bone specialists that we don't become so bone centric that we forget about those uh, important life events that of course we're all trying to avoid and that is a fall. So however strong our bones are, you know, if we fall in such a way that we put a lot of force through our bones, they will break. You know, that is just a, a mechanical engineering type of factor. So if we can avoid falls, then the risk of breaking bones is incredibly reduced. So what we try to do, particularly perhaps as time passes by and people get older and we know that bone density tends to fall, if we can promote bone strength by all sorts of means, ultimately perhaps including drug treatment, and also be responsible about how we try to reduce the risk of falls. That's all great. And we, as I say, we won't be covering falls here, but if you want to find more about how you can improve your balance and do practical positive things, then have a look on our website. So that that's all great. Now, let's move on a bit and talk about some of these specific risk factors. Now, one of the ones that I know is really important is if you've already broken a bone, that's a really good sign if, a, if you've had, and we call them fragility or osteoporotic fractures. So if you've had one, that's a really important risk factor, isn't it? Can you can you just explain a bit more about that? Yeah, and it's perhaps worthwhile as well just expanding on the, the fragility element because, and I think it links to what I've said before, that um, any one of us, if we have enough trauma through our bones, then we can break a bone. Um, and that's really terribly unfortunate, but it may not be that we have a particular predisposition to fractures. However, fragility fractures, in other words, a, a fracture as a result of a fall from standing height or less, where there's relatively small amounts of trauma, that is a hugely powerful predictor of risk of fracture in the future. And that will at least double the risk of fracture. So simply knowing that somebody's had a fracture at any site, really, particularly vertebral or spinal fractures, they are so powerfully predictive of fractures in the future that allows us to categorise risk as being high, potentially to the extent that people um, with previous fractures, with other risk factors and with low bone density, for instance, may well be people that would benefit from drug, some drug therapies. So you're absolutely right. Having had a previous fracture from minimal force or trauma at least doubles the risk of fractures in the future. And that's quite a simple thing to work out. Most people will know that they've had the obvious non-vertebral fractures. What we're working on nationally and beyond now is trying to pick up people who have spinal fractures that they may not have or they have little awareness of. So absolutely, previous fractures is towards the top of the list of risk factors um, that we need to be aware of 
to determine what can we do to prevent fractures in those particularly at risk groups. And perhaps I could add here, I'm, we're thinking particularly, aren't we, of the older person. That's because, as you say, this is more of a condition of older age. So that's very much the focus, isn't it, um, in, in, in older age? It is, and, and it's it's a good practical point. So, you know, uh, every day that I'm clinical, uh, I'll talk to patients and I'll ask them, have they had fractures? And quite rightly, most people recognise uh, um, that I've had none in my adult life, but I remember when I was 11 and I fell off the slide. And so people, I think, generally recognise that just having perhaps a single fracture as a child doing childlike things, or that used to be childlike things when people are, out, are outdoors playing, um, that that, I think, is, is simply a, a trauma-related incident and it doesn't count towards our long-term risk of fracture. However, if there's been a number of fractures, even, you know, in 40s and 50s, uh, particularly after the age of 50, though that makes us start scratching our heads thinking, is that just a simple accident or is there something underlying this as a risk factor that means that we need to shine a spotlight to determine whether further treatment or interventions can be taken to prevent fractures in the decades of life to come? That's great. That's really useful. So that's um, having had a fracture. Let's let's move on to something else now, which I think is very much your area of expertise, and that's other medical conditions. So what people don't always understand is that having another medical condition can put you at risk of osteoporosis and and fractures. Could you talk us through some of those, the kind of common conditions, and perhaps the people that you, that are your patients often? Sure, and it's it's important in in joined up medicine that we don't think about isolated conditions that we think of a person in their entirety and think of links between medical conditions and I suppose we can broadly categorize things if we start with uh, inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or inflammatory bowel disease such as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease um, these are all conditions where the the makeup of the body is in turmoil through there being an inflammatory process and we know these conditions in isolation can have effects on bone density and increasing fracture risk and as we consider the tools that we use to assess fracture risk um, these kind of conditions are known as secondary causes of osteoporosis and anybody who has a diagnosis of osteoporosis or is at high risk of fracture should have various blood tests performed to screen for these conditions because occasionally the bone and osteoporosis readouts can occur either before or in parallel to the genesis of some of these um, conditions as well. Uh, on top of that, these inflammatory conditions as well as in their own right causing uh, increased risk of fracture often and historically this is certainly the case those conditions were treated with steroids which we know that steroids have an independent uh, increased risk of fracture associated with them so you have that double whammy effect of a treatment that's helpful to reduce the inflammation but the background inflammatory condition plus the steroids adds up to increased risk of fracture right. from and my any others, sorry any, any other sort of conditions that that, that jump to mind and, and I suppose particularly uh, as an endocrinologist, um, I, I see not just people with um, bone and calcium related problems, but conditions like an overactive thyroid, thyrotoxicosis, Graves disease, where thyroid le hormone levels are high, that has an effect to reduce bone density. Another very common condition is primary hyperparathyroidism. So that's overactivity of the parathyroid glands as well. Um, so, so these are the kind of things that I would see um, routinely in, in my practice. Another area that's probably, I don't want to confuse things, but met, worth mentioning is um, vitamin D related issues. So people with poor absorption, celiac disease, malabsorption when they can't absorb um, uh, uh, calcium. So that uh, is, is another condition where if you have somebody with celiac disease, then screening for osteoporosis is important. So there's a whole host of um, conditions uh, and, and I suppose whether it fits best here as a as a disease entity, but um, premature um, menopause. So period stopping before the age of 45 that has 
not being treated with HRT confers added risk um, for fracture as well through low bone density. But it's important to recognise that if you've had adequately treated um, uh, early cessation of periods by taking some form of oestrogen, then that largely negates that risk. So the area that we're particularly interested in is somebody who has maybe surgery, uh, a surgical menopause in their 30s, and that still does happen. So it's really important to have adequate oestrogen exposure because the longer the skeleton remains deficient in exposure to oestrogen, the greater the effect of lower bone density and the greater the effect on increasing fracture risk in due course. And that may not happen in the near term, i.e. if somebody had that uh, intervention at the age of 35, we wouldn't be expecting to see fractures by 40, but by mid 50s, 60s and beyond, we may see this come through in terms of bone density and an increased risk of uh, fracture as well. That's that's really helpful. So early menopause, we often don't think of it as a medical condition but you're pointing out things that we can do that's really helpful so let's talk a little bit more about medications so medications that are so important and helpful for one medical condition can unfortunately end up causing problems for bones now you've mentioned steroids like prednisolone um, what other medications sort of top the list in terms of affecting bones yeah it, it's uh, I, th I think your lead in there is very important because what's great and a demonstration of medicine moving forward to help with some really serious and important diseases, how there's a, a consequence in another organ system. So top of the list has to be in terms of frequency uh, is, is breast cancer, a hugely common disease that over the years has been revolutionized in terms of its management by use of drugs called aromatase inhibitors that the, the cancer specialists use that are incredibly effective um, in reducing the risk of uh, relapse and recurrence of breast cancer. So it's you know, fantastic drugs. They work by preventing there being really any oestrogen in the circulation. So following on from what we were talking about uh, relating to the menopause, then they can have really hugely profound effect at taking the stripping the oestrogen out of the system which is beneficial to reduce the risk of breast cancer, but that means that the skeleton doesn't get exposed to those really important, the really important sex steroid as oestrogen. So reduction in bone density and increasing fracture risk will be seen in those patients as well. And in general, cancer doctors are very astute and uh, keep close eye on bone density in patients treated with these drugs called aromatase inhibitors. And there's good crosstalk now between oncology or cancer doctors and bone specialists, and there's guidelines in place uh, to try to ensure that bone density scans are performed regularly, that lifestyle factors are addressed properly, and in those who are, out, who are at risk are treated with the appropriate bone active drugs. But clearly here, we have breast cancer and we have uh, fracture risk, we have to find some middle ground where the huge beneficial effects of the drug are married up to um, us intervening to alleviate that increase in risk of fracture by using some of our bone active drugs in patients where that's the right thing to do. Really helpful. Tell us a bit more about uh, prostate cancer. I mean, that is that the same? Are there other treatments there? I think I've understood that they too are possibly going to put you at risk. Could you explain yeah, a bit more about that? It is. It's a highly analogous situation. So in terms of um, prevalence or numbers of people affected with huge numbers of women affected with breast cancer, huge numbers of men are affected by breast uh, by prostate cancer. So so this is a huge area of um, of practice. And in the same way as oestrogen can feed breast cancer, testosterone can feed prostate cancer. So there are drugs uh, that are broadly known as androgen deprivation therapy that, again, strip out the uh, biologically active testosterone that can feed growth of prostate cancer. So, again, this is very mainstream practice in cancer therapy, but the, the effect of testosterone in men is to promote bone health. So if we take testosterone away, then we have the same effect in men as we do in women, having low levels of oestrogen. So that 
lack of testosterone causes low bone density, increased risk of osteoporosis, and increased risk uh, of, of, um, of fractures as well. So they go hand in glove, prostate cancer in men, breast cancer in women, the drugs strip out the sex steroids, as we call them, which then have an effect on bone. So these are most definitely risk factors. And again, the, the guidelines and the follow-up <clears throat> for men on this, these androgen deprivation therapy drugs would be having regular bone density scans and using drugs if that's the appropriate intervention required. Thank you. That's that's really useful. One other drug that I think comes up in our risk checker is, is epilepsy drugs, uh, anti-epilepsy drugs. Um, could you just explain a little bit about that and why they might affect bones? Yes, it's it probably mechanistically probably not quite as clear as the, as the other two. So we've known that anti-epilepsy or anti-convulsant therapy, is, uh, as they're sometimes known, um, can have an effect on vitamin D metabolism so that more actively metabolizing vitamin D away. So that in its own right, we've touched on vitamin D before, vitamin D and calcium are obviously important components of bone and bone strength. So that's probably one reason that they are recognized as um, increasing uh, chance of having low bone density. The other is an important factor, um, and that is of course with epilepsy and seizure conditions, it's quite feasible that increased risk uh, of having seizures and the trauma associated with having a seizure can also increase the risk of fracture. So you, one of the earlier points you raised is, are there any risk factors that are independent of bone density? So somebody having a seizure on the basis, or a fit, um, on the basis of having perhaps even relatively mildly reduced bone density, you can see an increased risk of fracture. And I certainly have seen many, many cases of really quite fit, uh, active, um, middle-aged men and women who've had seizures and have sustained fractures and that's simply due to the forces that get conveyed through the bones as a result of the spasms of the muscles. So it's a rather complex area, but it is um, it is recognised as a risk factor. So quite rightly, you know, sits on that risk factor list. Right. Lovely. Right. Phew. We've heard about an awful lot of risk factors and we want this to be a positive session for you all. So let's move on a bit and talk about why is it good to know all this? Why is it good to know and think about your risk? Um, um, are there positive things or positive steps that you can take? Hopefully there are. Absolutely. So information is king. You know, I'm a great believer. I'm I'm, uh, uh, I'm not a traditionalist as to, you know, doctor knows the answer and there's your script, off you go and, and kind of do as I say. I, th I think understanding and hopefully what we've been doing is providing some context to these things that you can just tick a box to say it's a risk factor, but, but why? So I think having an understanding, a personal understanding puts you in control. It empowers you. It empowers you to have good, healthy, informed discussions with healthcare providers as well. And of course, I'm a, I'm a specialist in this area, um, but most um, people and patients will be seeing doctors with less expertise and, and GPs and practice nurses um, and other healthcare professionals. So I think going along, if that's the right thing to do, armed with information that you clearly understand yourself, you can have a truly informed discussion with those healthcare professionals to, to debate and consider I recognise that I have these risk factors, and we all have risk factors for various things, um, uh, that, that, that you, you can consider what, if anything, needs to be done next. So I think it comes back to where I started from. Information is king. To have that understanding is absolutely the way to go. And, and, and I certainly am not negative about, you know, we mentioned drugs and, and, and diseases and risk factors, but if we can optimise the disease states that some people will have, um, by using minimal effective doses of therapies to achieve benefit with mitigating risk. So we can only do this if we have the information in front of us to have the discussion. What we don't want is this broad brush approach as to it usually works for most people. We want to try to make this personalised medicine and for you to have an understanding yourself of your own conditions is absolutely central to where medicine's going over the next decades to come.
Yes, and a really important message there that I think you were pointing to is, is that actually managing some of these medical conditions that may be causing a problem is a, a really great positive step forward. So even though you've got something that's underlying uh, your osteoporosis, if you manage the condition, that's going to help in itself. I think that's a really nice positive message. Um, and also, as you say, it's about having your your situation as a whole considered by your healthcare professional. Perhaps talk a bit about that other next step, which might be that you need some kind of formal bone health assessment um so and that um that's obviously another step forward for some people um perhaps you could talk a bit in fact maybe i'll ask i have another question which i was going to ask you which is does everybody need a bone density scan because that is what we get asked and i know that's not the answer but it may be that you need other kinds of, of bone health assessment do you, do you want to just talk about that a bit that would be helpful yeah, it's it's a it's a recurring theme, and it's very topical issue as to what role and when do bone density scans come into play. Um, and I suppose at one end of the spectrum, you know, you you can take that to an extreme and say, well, are we in a position where there should be screening with with bone density scans? Um, and I think the short answer to that is is no, not with bone density scans because actually they're helpful. But they're often not very helpful unless they're contextualized. So I think we need to wind all the way back to where we started here. What clinical risk factors are we aware of that will allow us to derive an informed decision as to whether a bone density scan could help us even further? So I would always um, prefer to start with a conversation um, with a, a person or a, a patient um, to talk through some of these risk factors that we've been mentioning. And you know, simply in my mind, um, it soon becomes very clear as to whether there are standout risk factors that are coming onto my radar. Um, uh, 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 and, and if they're not there, then that's absolutely great. And in individuals who have few or no clinical risk factors, um, then just simply doing a bone density scan for the sake of it is 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 not great medicine so let's start and build the story from the basics up by having the conversations reflecting on past asking about um, family history whether there have been previous fractures of course the age of the patient the gender we haven't really spoken about differences between fracture risk between men and women but there are so, so I think it's doing the basics really well and then taking forward from that that shall I say that almost intermediate group where you think there's a few things going on here, but I'm not quite sure if it's enough to launch us into thinking about drug therapy. So those, that's the group where absolutely a bone density scan is central and it will push us one way or another. It may be reassuring or it may be, no, I think on balance, you know, we're moving on towards perhaps more active intervention. So it's a great test, but it's not a a blunt test that you know you just kind of wander up and um, and have it that's that's not good medicine really um and i doubt whether we'll ever have the day that um uh, you know it, it will be so mainstream without thinking first and this is a general principle in medicine just because something's available doesn't mean it's the best thing to do you put your thinking head on first you contextualize things and then you use a test on the basis of some clinical context and we now have this other thing, complicated phrase, but fracture risk assessment, don't we? So there are other tools that a healthcare professional can use to sort of build up a picture of risk and decide what the whether you need a drug treatment or not. So Absolutely. that's really helpful. Um, let's talk a little bit then about um, the new Royal Osteoporosis Society risk checker. So this is like a quiz or a questionnaire that we've developed with our clinical team to to help people start out on that journey really and it's for those who haven't already been checked out and treated uh, tested and treated um, and 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 you if you haven't seen our risk checker and you, you you think it's for you then have a look at it it's on our website after you've we finished this session so what it's not about is diagnosis and as we've just discussed telling you whether you need a scan or a medication but it is about raising awareness and helping you to take the next step. Um, we have covered some of this, but Professor Gittos, perhaps you could just explain a little bit more about how perhaps the checker might uh, work to, to, to put, point people in the, in the right direction. It, it's, it's not sending everyone off to see their, their doctor or their healthcare profession. Yeah, it's, it's a great initiative um, and it's all about, I know it's, it's a term that potentially gets overused, but this empowerment, um, you know, it's something 
it, it shines a spotlight that allows us with very simple questions that we about ourselves we will know the answers um, and by simply responding you know relating to some of these risk factors that we've been talking about today it will look for I think I, I use that standout risk factors those things that are I avoid use the word red flags they're kind of orange flags perhaps um, that make us think that there could be something going on here so I think it's a it's a fantastic resource that you mentioned the the FRAX or fracture risk assessment that is used in slightly more clinical setting but it's largely similar to that and it provides the individual some insight in a condensed way as to do I have any of these primary risk factors that mean I should go and have a conversation with somebody else about them so I think I think it's it's, it's raising awareness when the critical areas in osteoporosis and trying to prevent fractures is awareness. Awareness at every level, at a government level, at a health service, at a hospital level, but in ourselves. You know, if we don't have awareness of our own risk factors, then we can just simply blunder our way, you know, getting a little bit older day by day. But having that insight as to this is something I can do something about and not just being dare I say, not turning into a victim of osteoporosis and sustaining a vertebral fracture or a hip fracture. Let's use this in a proactive manner, in a simple, you can do it in the comfort of your own living room, fill in the form, see if you've got the risk factors. If you have some risk factors, and it'll tell you where you sit in terms of risk factors, you know, take those along and have a, have a conversation with your healthcare professional. So I think it pushes the conversation on. Yes, thank you. Great. I think that's a great summary. And, and, and perhaps if I could add to that, as, as you've said, there are one or two and we've we've gone over them. The risk factors that might be suggesting a, a more immediate conversation with your healthcare professional. So, as you've said, it's that sort of broken bone that's happened over the age of 50 unexpectedly. And if you're on some of those key medical treatments like prostate cancer, breast cancer treatments and steroids. And I think the final one is early menopause. So yeah, just some top ones that need a more an urgent discussion and others that have that discussion at a later stage, but you don't need to do it so immediately. Um, yeah, I think that's that's been a great summary. Um, we've, we've really come to the end now. There's lots more we could talk about, but I think we've uh, we've really covered the most important points. What we haven't really gone into any detail about is, is like positive lifestyle actions. Um, and there's lots of information on our website about that. But you, if you, for everyone, and not just if you're in that no risk factor group, there are lots of positive things you can do. And I don't know, Professor Gittos, perhaps a quick summary of the things that you talk to your patient about, patients about just to set people off in that in the right direction. Yeah, I... Uh... It is really important and, and it's something that, you know, we we can all do. Um, so so I, be I believe in the principle, if you can keep things simple, then keep it simple. Um, so so I think the, 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 the advice around not smoking, um, drinking um, moderately, at least, um, so less than two units of alcohol per day. And, and I think perhaps that's not so well known in relation to bone health. People recognise it in relation to liver disease and stroke risk and all the rest of it, but it's important for bone health as well. Uh, weight bearing exercise, and I know Sarah, you're very well positioned to comment better on that than, than I, I, I am, but uh, people often ask me, so, so I need to go jogging then, do I? And I say, no, just walking is absolutely fine. Weight bearing exercise, uh, 20 to 30 minutes, three or four times a week. You know, the bones like the vibrations, the sense of, of movement and weight bearing. And of course, uh, a sensible, healthy, balanced diet. And I think in the past we've complicated diets by saying if you want to present osteoporosis, you need this diet. If you want stroke and diabetes and obesity, whereas I think now we're, we're talking in a far more joined up way. It is about healthy, balanced diet. It's about ensuring that you have adequate vitamin D. And for most, the vast majority of people, particularly through the winter months, will be um, taking a vitamin D supplement not so much calcium supplement. There are some online calcium calculators that help you assess your calcium intake. So in essence, those are the kind of the package of quite high level common sense type of approaches that we can all do um, and we can modify them from tomorrow if they happen to be within our risk factor list. Utterly modifiable. Great. Thank you. Really simple, really straightforward and, and that's really helpful too. So 
Right, we're going to have to stop now. Um, uh, lots of information there, and I hope you're all feeling better informed and able to take positive steps to manage your own risk uh, and, and take any positive lifestyle changes too, if you need them. So thank you. Thank you to Professor Gittos and to all of you for listening. Um, just to say that there are lots of links to other in relevant information alongside this session. And we also would love you to take the chance to give us a bit of feedback to help us improve sessions in the future. So thank you. Thank you to all of you and goodbye. <laughs>